Tom Landy, I'm the director of the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture here at the College of the Holy Cross. And um, I'm really moved by the opportunity to welcome our two guests tonight because I know that they'll help us face in a powerful way the terrible reality of wrongful convictions in America. It's a reality that's frightening enough in and of itself, made worse by the facts that our country has one of the highest rates of incarceration in the world, and that our prison system, harsh as it is for anything other than white collar crime, is overwhelmingly prioritizes punishment instead of rehabilitation. There are undoubtedly injustices in courts and prisons all over the world, but I'd say our system is the one that I feel most responsible for and therefore most disappointed in at many times. I'm grateful too that all of you have come out tonight to hear from the guests and I hope that the realities that we face up to tonight will help change what you think it means to work for justice. I'm also grateful for a Holy Cross parent, Jeff Morton, who a dedicated supporter of the Innocence Project who helped bring our guests here tonight and to the Ream Family Fund which supported tonight's event. I have to confess if I look at your age out there, that I grew up when I was your age, I grew up with and sustained through college a naive belief that people in prison were always and only there after a rigorous process that put them there based on evidence, quote, beyond a reasonable doubt. Certainly people convicted of major crimes could be vetted even more, I thought, would be vetted even more. And forensics, which was a science I thought was a science that just was sort of indubitable, I wasn't a science major, so you can forgive me maybe, but um, that uh, forensics could ensure that false convictions uh, or any evidence used in court was not uh, in doubt. I truly believe that false convictions were not much more common than unicorns, and I was not unusual in that belief. Beginning in the 1990s, though, I started to hear about many people being released because new technologies like DNA testing revealed that they were sent to prison, including to death row, for crimes that we subsequently could be certain they had not committed. People who were innocent had been falsely convicted, and people who were victims were false, falsely told that their perpetrators were safely locked behind bars. And it was happening so frequently that it was clear that those, those exonerations were happening so frequently that it was clear that false convictions did not by any means belong to the, in the same imaginary as unicorns or Bigfoot. The work that led to those releases was accomplished under the aegis of a remarkable initiative called the Innocence Project. One of the hardest things for me to imagine or confront is what it's like to be a person accused of a crime that I did not commit to be sent to jail for decades, or a lifetime, or even sentenced to death. Marvin Anderson, who joins us tonight, confronted just that nightmare. While I feel sure that it would have destroyed my soul to have endured the same events he did, Marvin, with the help of the Innocence Project and through his own interior strength, ultimately overcame the evil that confronted him. Let's step back to what happened. While I was just out of college, living in my naive bubble, Marvin, at age 18, not too much younger than me, younger than, I'm guessing, almost every person in this room, in fact, found himself accused of robbery, sodomy, abduction, and rape. Despite evidence that he was not the assailant, he was convicted in a court of law to 210 years in prison. He stayed in prison even when someone came forward and confessed to the crime. Almost 20 years later, following repeated efforts to allow DNA sequencing to re-examine the evidence, appeals that ran up against roadblock after roadblock in a system not willing to double check to see if it was wrong, the Innocence Project won access to DNA records that excluded Anderson as the perpetrator. In 2001, he became the 99th person in America to be exonerated due to post conviction DNA testing, and he calls himself the 99th sometimes. The Innocence Project, founded in 1992, for the last 30 years has been at the forefront of criminal justice reform, using DNA and other scientific advancements to prove wrongful convictions. 
for the last four years now, I guess she's starting her fourth year, our guest, tonight's guest, Christina Swarns, has been leading this vital work as the Innocence Project's executive director. She previously served in multiple leadership roles advocating for racial justice through the law, including at the Office of the Appellate Defender, one of New York City's oldest providers of appellate representation to poor people convicted of felonies. At the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund and the Philadelphia Community Defender's Office. Christina is the only black woman to argue in 2000, the 2016 Supreme Court term and is one of the few black women to have argued before the nation's highest court. Another first, parenthetically, she'll forgive me. Many of us also are looking forward next spring to welcoming Rachel Swarns, her sister, to speak at Holy Cross about her recent book, The 272, which traces the history of the enslaved people who were sold by the Jesuits, bringing in funds that helped launch Holy Cross. Christina has the honor not only of being half of the first sibling team that I know of to be invited at Holy Cross, but the first of the two siblings. <laughs> Most importantly, though, she's here to bring her expertise to help us understand how the sort of injustices uncovered beginning 30 years ago are, in fact, far from solved and what we need to do to solve them. If you think that this is no longer a problem now that we have DNA testing available, she'll help us see why that is naive. So before I turn it over to them for a conversation, I do want to note that Marvin, who's here, who at 18 had been trying to become a firefighter when he was arrested, uh, now, uh, well, he's retired now, until recently served as chief of the Hanover, Virginia Fire Department, where he oversaw a team of 30 people. He's also a father of three children and serves on the board of directors of the Innocence Project. So please join me in welcoming Christina and Marvin to Holy Cross. They will engage in a conversation and take some questions from you later. So thank you so much, Thomas, and thanks so much to Jeff for um, getting us here tonight. It's really our honor and privilege um, to speak with all of you about the work that we do. Um, it is um, both of our life's work and our passion. So I want to start out just by playing a video, and then we're going to go into our conversation. Think back to your happiest memories. <laughs> your wedding day and graduation. The everyday moments you'll never forget. Some people miss these moments. The day your baby took their first steps. I was forced to miss watching my son growing up into the man that he's become. You know, God willing, I'm hoping that I'm around for my grandson. The day they were born. It's my you in a place like that, you know, you didn't do nothing wrong. And and you have to give birth with him cuffs and shackles in your feet. They hardly let me touch him. I was begging the nurse. I told her, I don't know when I'm going to touch him again. For so many, these memories are tainted. The only photo that I had from my childhood was the one being let out of the prison. I was robbed of a normal life. It was a tragedy that Mr. Burton spent some 20 years in jail for a crime that he did not commit. I offer my apologies on behalf of a system that failed me. One of their happiest moments is the day they were released from prison. 19 years! Yeah.
So uh, the Innocence Project was founded in 1992. Over the past 31 years, we have freed or exonerated 200, oh, <laughs> I'll wait. <laughs> So over the last 31 years, we have freed or exonerated over 278 people. They collectively spent more than 3,000 years in prison for crimes they did not commit. Um, it has been my honor and the honor of my career to lead this organization, and it is my privilege to work side by side uh, with Marvin who is, uh, as you heard, not only a person who is wrongfully convicted, but also a member of the board of directors of the Innocence Project. So we decided that we we're gonna do a little bit of a fishbowl conversation, and then have you all join in um, for the last 15 minutes. So you know, write down your questions, and then you know, line up in the center, and we will keep going um, until you all are sick of us, basically. All right, you ready, Marvin? Yes. All right, so tell us how we got here. <laughs> ah. In 1982, can you all hear me? Okay, good. In 1982, I was 18 years old, working a summer job. And I had two uh, officers approach me on my job and ask me questions about a rape that had taken place over the weekend. And one of the officers I knew, and I knew him as well as I've actually eaten dinner at his table with his family. So he came to my job, questioned me, asked me where was my whereabouts around 6.30, 7 o'clock that Saturday afternoon. And I gave him an honest answer, you know, I could have been anywhere, which is true. 18 years old, you don't keep track of time. You just go and have fun. And uh, then he started talking about a woman being raped. And when he mentioned that, you know, I'm like, whoa, this is going in a different direction. Let's pay attention. Um, the other officer asked me, you know, where were you at around 6.30, 7 o'clock? Do I know anything about it? And of course, I told him, no. Other than what I'm hearing people are talking about in the neighborhood. Now, when I walked into this room, I noticed a color picture of me on the desk, which was my job ID. But I also noticed some black and white pictures as well. So uh, the officer asked me, would I be willing to take a polygraph test? Now, the only thing I knew about a polygraph test is that if you tell the truth, they'll let you go. I agreed to do so. We was about maybe 10 minutes from police lockup. We left my job. I wasn't in handcuffs and proceeded towards police lockup. Before we arrived there, they stopped by the victim's apartment. I watched this officer take those same photos that I saw on the desk when I walked into the room, goes into the victim's apartment, spent about 10 minutes there, and came back out. We proceeded down to my apartment, which was right around the corner from her. They walked into my apartment, they retrieved a pair of green and yellow sweatpants, a brown pullover sh V-neck shirt, and we went down to the county lockup. When I arrived to the county lockup, I was informed that it would take too much time to do a polygraph test. Would I be willing to sit in a lineup? I have nothing to hide. I agreed to do so. They brought in eight other inmates, along with me. We're all standing in the same jumpsuit color. The victim comes in, she look over all of us, she walks out of the room. She comes back into the room, look at us once again, and walks out of the room. Two minutes later, the officer comes back into the room, and I just looked at him. And I said, she picked me. He looked at me, did he say anything? I said, did, he, did she pick me? He said, yes, how did you know? I said, I just know. That night, I was arrested, booked for counter-rape, sodomy, robbery, and induction. 
posted bond, got out that same night. While I'm leaving the, the jail that night, the bailiff that was working that night overheard my family talking about my case or what, what I was there for. And my younger brother said, hey, Mom, you know, everybody in the neighborhood is saying Pop Lincoln is the person that did this, not Marvin. And the bailiff overheard that. He said, Pop Lincoln, I know this guy. He just got out of here on a rape charge. So I get home very next day. You know, I'm trying to figure out why me? What happened? I didn't do this. You know, and we go to our attorney. And we, I mean, we gave everything to him. What the people in the community are saying, who did this? Um, we even had witnesses testify that on that very same day, the clothes that he was wearing. Gave all this information to my attorney. The first preliminary hearing we goes to, the victim got up on stand, she testified while well, she was asked to describe the person that attacked me. She said, a very light-skinned, complexion person, short kinky hair, straight white teeth, no scars or blemishes in his face. Okay. She was asked if the person that attacked you is in this courtroom. She said yes. He asked her, will you stand up and identify this person? She stood up and she pointed at me. This is the first preliminary hearing now. The second one, that very same question was addressed to her. Describe your attacker on that evening. She said once again, a very, very light-skinned, complexion person with short, kinky hair, straight white teeth, no scars or blemishes in his face. Now I'm sitting there thinking, that ain't me. We got this. You know, <laughs> nah, I ain't light-skinned. No way. December 14th trial day. Now, according to the law, Every, brother, every person is, has the right to a trial, a jury trial of their peers. That's by law. My jury consisted of eight women, four men, all white. Now, 1982, I'm from the South, small community. Race is still there. My daughter said that everything's going to be all right. I believed it. Trial went on. Victim got on the stand. She had testified once again. The question was asked, can you describe the person that attacked you? Once again, she testified, very, very light-skinned and complexion person, short kinky hair, straight white teeth, no scars or blemishes in his face. You may not see me right now but I have a scar in the middle of my forehead. I received when I was about 13 years old trying to show off in front of a girl that I like. Okay? Everything that she said, the person that she described, she described someone else. And every time she described this person, I looked over at the jury and the expression on the woman's face that I saw, I knew I was going to prison. During a recess time in this case, in my case, I'm standing outside of the courtroom, I'm talking to my brother, and the victim approached me. She goes, excuse me, sir, can I get a light? I reached in my pocket, pulled out my lighter, lit her cigarette for her. She said, thank you, and walked back to her own family. My brother go, man, do you know who that is? I said, yeah, that's her. Why would she come over here? I said, maybe she needed to get a better look at me. We went back into the courtroom, trial proceeded on. I didn't realize my trial was over with until the judge said, Mr. White, do you have your closing statement? And I went, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. I haven't testified. I want to testify. He said, I don't need you. Everything is good. 
The jury deliberated for no more than 45 minutes and came back with a verdict of guilty on two counts of rape, sodomy, robbery, and abduction. The judge asked, do you have a recommendation for a citizen? They said, yes, 210 years. I turned around from where I was standing to look at my family who was sitting directly behind me and I could not see them. I could hear their voices, but I could not see them. I could hear my mom saying, baby, baby, everything's gonna be all right. You did not do this. I could hear my grandmother saying, everything's gonna be all right. We know you did not do this, but I could not see them. After going in to the penal system, trying to prove my innocence, I had gone through three attorneys. The fourth attorney, they received a letter from an inmate saying that, hey, they have the wrong person. He did not commit the crime. Now, my attorney at that time, he was like, is this a joke? We have a person who's confessing to everything. Should we believe him? We took a chance. We got him back into court in front of the same judge that was a judge over my trial. This man got on stand and testified that he approached a white woman walking through a path with a bucket of chicken. He was riding a bicycle and he asked if he could walk with her home. She said no, she refused. He rolled down in the path through yards, faked an injury. When she stopped to assist him, that's when he grabbed her, dragged her into the woods, raped her, beat her, held her there for over hours, and dragged her further into the woods and did the same thing over. This person's name is John Otis Lincoln. Now, I'm going to give you the description of John Otis Lincoln. John Otis Lincoln at the time was 5'8", very, very light skin and complexion, had short hair, he had no scars or blemishes in his face, and straight white teeth. He was wearing black slack pants, a brown pullover v-neck shirt. This is what the victim described her attacker. Not only that, but he was riding a bicycle. This man testified on stand word for word to what the victim testified to. I'm sitting there in court saying, oh yes, I'm going home. He's telling the truth. The judge refused to give us an answer that day. Two months later, I get a letter in the mail saying that the judge denied your appeal. And his reason was because he did not believe Lincoln's testimony because Lincoln had wrote him over the years saying he had done other things and the judge did not believe him, saying he's a big liar. I remained in prison after that letter knowing that you have a person who is telling the truth, no matter how many times he's lied to you before, but he's telling the truth almost word for word to what the victim described happened to her on that day. And he refused to believe it. In the early 80s, I was approached by one of the counselors at the correction center I was at and asked me, have I ever heard about the Innocent Project? No, what's that? Oh, they're an organization that try to help people who are wrongfully convicted. You need to write them a letter. I wrote a letter, poured my heart out, explained everything that happened in my case, just wanting to have someone to believe I'm telling the truth. A few months later, I received a letter back saying, hey, Marvin, how you doing? 
understand the circumstances that you're in, but I need some more information. That night, I was on the phone calling my mom. Hey, I need transcripts for this, 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 this. No problem. This is the address you need to send it to. No problem. When they received all of my transcripts, that's when they decided to take over my case. Now, it wasn't that easy. It had got to the point that they had ran out of options. There was nowhere else they could look. All my appeals had been spent. There was nothing else they could do. But there was this one attorney who refused to give up on me. They was about to close my case. She begged Byron Peter, said, please do not close this case. There's something out there. So Mr. Sheck decided to call back down to Virginia and have them look through the archive. There has to be something. And when they did that, that's when they found samples of the perk kit for my case in 1982. DNA testing was ran. I was excluded. But it wasn't enough. The state of Virginia wanted to stop DNA testing further because they wanted to see who actually had the chain of custody of this evidence, whether or not I had any attempt to have possession of this evidence. Now, I didn't know that much about the law, so I'm asking, what is chain of custody? In other words, they wanted to know had this evidence been in the hands of anybody else other than state? Well, I was incarcerated. Couldn't have been in my possession. The attorney at the time I had when all this was going on, he wasn't even working on my case. It was the Innocent Project. They in New York. I'm in Virginia. We didn't have a chain of custody of it. Once we got all of that work out, it took us going back to the circuit court and having the Commonwealth Attorney there put in a motion to have DNA testing done. And once that happened, it excluded me. But not only excluded me, it matched the real perpetrator. The real perpetrator of that case was John Lewis Lincoln, the very same man who came back in 1986, testified in front of this judge, and said he committed the crime. It wasn't me. When that happened, and we finally got the approval from Governor Mark Warner, I was exonerated with a full unconditional pardon from the state of Virginia. That's when my life began again. And when I say it began again, because at the age of 10, I had a dream of becoming a fireman. When I was 18, that was taken away from me. Even when I made parole in 97, I could not pursue that dream because I was a convicted felony. Not only a convicted felony, but a sex offender. Everything that I dreamed of becoming as a child, as a teenager, was taken away. But when I got that, that party, second chance, I applied for the fire academy. Now, at that time, I was 34 years old. Going through a fire academy with 18, 19 year olds, and 20 years old. Oh my goodness. They called me Pop. <laughs> hey, I'm Pop, but this is my dream. I went through the academy, graduated, well, they had two number one graduates. I was one and a female. The only reason she won the top spot because she used to bring our cheese brownies every night we had training. <laughs> but her and I became best of friends and we both graduated number one in our class. 
Not only that, she joined the station that I was at. And we worked several years together. But to be able to have given a second chance to pursue a dream that I had since I was a child, that's what the Innocence Project gave back to me. After graduation, I moved up in the ranks to lieutenant, captain, and then until I retired three years ago, I was the chief of the very same fire department that I joined when I was 13 years old for the last 15 years. Um, I started my own trucking company. I raised three kids as a single parent. Sold my trucking company two years ago. And today, I have three grandkids. I have the opportunity to work in public schools with high schoolers and able to talk to them about what they are going through in life. Because today's society, our kids are afraid to talk to our parents, to ask questions that they don't understand. And sometimes the parents don't want to talk about issues, real issues, that are in this world. So it gives me joy and pride to not only represent the Innocent Project, but to be able to tell my life story, what I've gone through and struggle to push these issues that we have in our society. With the blessing of Christina, the Innocent Project, I'm on top of the world. Now, <clears throat> since I had to answer most of the questions the last couple of times we did our interviews, I have some questions for you. How did you find or come about the Innocent Project? What made you think about the Innocent Project? Let me just tell you about um following Marvin is not the best spot to be in, right? Because my story can never compare to what Marvin just shared. Um, and so I'm just, you know, I'm preparing you for the letdown after that wonderful story. So I grew up um, in Staten Island, New York. Um, and as you know, I have a sister who's exactly 12 months older than me. And she, I think, came out of the womb knowing what she wanted to do her entire life. She wanted to be a writer. She was going to be a journalist. She did all that. I was not that person. I was like the exact opposite. I never knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a hairstylist. I wanted to be an archaeologist. You name it, I wanted to be it. Um, and so I really did not have any idea for a very long time what I was going to do. I eventually landed on I wanted to be a lawyer. But there really weren't lawyers in my family. I wasn't a person that was really you know, surrounded by lawyers. So I didn't have a good understanding of what even that meant. But that was you know, where I ultimately settled. So I went to, uh, to Howard for undergrad. I went to law school. Um, I actually, even through law school, I still did not know what I was going to do. I say, I, I often, t my daughter tells me to tell this story all the time, because she's like, I, you know, she also doesn't know what she wants to do. So she's like, this is good for people to understand. Right? You don't actually have to know for a long time, and you can still succeed. Um, so really, all the way through law school, I did not know what I was going to do. I tried all kinds of different things, and nothing really landed. I graduated from law school. I came home to my uh, very indulgent parents who were like, listen, you can be here with a law degree from Penn Law School, um, but you have to go do something, right? And so like, go volunteer. And so I literally was just like, okay, I'm gonna pick the only place I think I would like to work. I did not know anyone there. I just cold called the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, right? I knew Thurgood Marshall, he was great you know, jurist and civil rights lawyer, I could go work for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. So I just cold called them and said, I would like to come and volunteer. And so they accepted. And on the first day, I sat in the conference room with Elaine Jones, who was then the head of the Legal Defense Fund. And she said, where, what department would you like to work in? And I said, I'll go to any of your departments. It doesn't matter, because I'm happy to do whatever. This is totally just a volunteer job. And you know, for I'd like to now say for reasons of history, 
right? She sent me to the capital, what was then the Capital Punishment Project. Um, the day I arrived, um, the Capital Punishment team were fighting um, against an active death warrant in Arkansas. They had a client who was um, facing execution for a case in Arkansas. He was picked up um, in a sweep. There was a, a, a rape and murder um, in a town called Pine Bluff, Arkansas. In response to the rape and murder, the police department there uh, sort of went around the town and picked up every black man uh, that was on the street that night. He was picked up. He was physically beaten and abused. He was also intellectually disabled, and so he gave a false confession, and that's what put him on death row. And this, so the day I walked up to the 17th floor of 99 Hudson Street, this was what was in front of us. And so this is the beginning of the story of how I get here. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, for the first time in my life, I watched lawyers litigate at the very, very, very highest levels, right, challenging really, you know, incredible issues of, of quality of counsel, of intellectual disability, of police abuse. Um, and all of a sudden now, you know, for the first time in my life, sort of that light bulb goes on and I say, this, this is it, right? This is what I want to do. So I was there, they got a stay of execution, it was amazing. Um, and then a job became available at the Legal Defense Fund and I, and I said, great, this is perfect, now you all can hire me. And they said, ah, ha, 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 no. <laughs> you are totally unqualified, which was true, right? They said, you are totally and entirely unqualified to work here. Um, for those of you that may not, I mean, this is like the best civil rights law firm in, you know, in American history. And I've just shown up and said, now you can hire. No. They were like, absolutely not. We will not hire you. Um, what you need to do is, you know, basically go get a clue. They were like, go work, go be a public defender and learn something about this world. And so, you know, I'm not, I'm not stupid. I know how to follow instructions. So I was like, sure, okay, great. Then that's what I'll do. And so sort of, um, I actually graduated from law school in 1993, which was one year, as it turns out, after the Innocence Project opened its doors. And so when I walked into the Manhattan uh, Legal Aid Society, which is a crim uh, the criminal defense division, the public defender for Manhattan, you know, it was at a time which is so di totally different from this one. It was at a time when people didn't believe that there were wrongful convictions, right? People firmly believed that our justice system, you know, was the best in the world and that, right, wrongful convictions were unicorns. Um, and so I walked into a, you know, a courtroom and a practice where, you know, it was, you know, every day it was an uphill battle to try to prove the innocence of people that I knew, right, that I was representing that were innocent. So I like to say I actually had a front row seat to the you know, revolution that was produced by the Innocence Project because I was litigating in criminal courts as we saw year after year people emerging, right? These powerful moments in courthouses, people emerging from decades behind bars and all of a sudden in criminal courts that I was litigating in front of, judges were starting to have questions for the first time about whether or not our system was working. They're starting to have questions about whether or not identifications were accurate when we had all right, ta been taught and it had burned in our, in our minds that, you know, that you know, I will never forget that face was, was the most powerful evidence, right? In my time, I was watching people begin to question right, this sort of evidence that was foundational. Um, so I spent a couple of years as a trial public defender, then I went on uh, at the urgence of the Legal Defense Fund to do death penalty work, and I moved to Philadelphia where I spent seven years, and in that time, the very first case that I was assigned to was a, um, a death sentence for a gentleman who was convicted of a rape and murder who said he was innocent, and moreover, he demanded DNA testing. And this was really early on. This is, we're talking about 1997. So we're now five years from the opening of the Innocence Project. DNA was not ubiquitous, right? This was sort of brand new stuff. Um, but we decided we were gonna take the challenge and we were gonna DNA test, and we did. And over the course of the never, next seven years, we tested uh, the DNA in that case. It came back inconclusive because there was so little left. Um, and we sort of continued litigating the case and then we came to a moment in the, uh, where we had to ask our client, look, we have a choice. We can do a second round of DNA testing on what we have, but if we do, 
that's it, right? It's going to use all of the biological evidence that's available, and there will never be another chance, right? So if science develops, we will never have another bite at this apple. And he was firmly committed. He's like, test it now. And I can remember the day I was getting on an airplane, and the testing was out, and my phone rang, and lo and behold, um, we had an exoneration. And that gentleman's name was Nicholas Yaris, and he became the first death-sentenced prisoner in Pennsylvania to be exonerated by DNA testing. And so this begins, right, my affiliation and my thinking about wrongful conviction, really in earnest, and the practice of representing people who are innocent. Um, because, you know, this Nick's case, like so many others, had a lot of bad facts in it, right? He made a incriminating, he incriminated himself in the, in the case. Um, you know, he wasn't a person without a criminal record, right? There was reasons for the police to be, to think that he was guilty. And it was clear to me, right, how powerful it was to see someone who may have looked guilty be totally innocent. And it was a reminder to me, right, as a, as a lawyer, right, you have to check all of whatever your assumptions are or whatever your beliefs are about who is and is not guilty. You have to check all of that and go only where the science takes you, right, only where the evidence takes you. So after, when I litigated that case, right, like I said, DNA was new. We didn't know how to do it. The only place we knew to go to to figure out how to litigate that case and get that to the exoneration was the Innocence Project. And so it was in 1997, I picked up the phone and called, I just again, cold called, and said, we've got this case, tell me what to do. And so we litigated it totally in partnership and under the supervision and guidance of the Innocence Project. And so from that point on, I sort of you know, maintained a relationship with our co-founders, Barry Sheck and Peter Neufeld. Um, and for the next, whatever, 20 years, uh, we I presented at conferences, we invited them to present at conferences, um, and so we worked together. And so ultimately in, you know, 2000, when I was running the Office of the Appellate Defender, the opportunity to run the Innocence Project presented itself. And, you know, I had a job, I was happy, I was doing things that were, you know, making me happy. But, you know, once the call came and I had the invitation, it really was, once I sat down with it, really the opportunity to lead what I absolutely believe, because I witnessed, uh, is the most transformative criminal legal system reform organization in American history. It is the work of this organization that has taught this country, right, that our system doesn't work as we hoped, and it has led this country more importantly, or equally as importantly, in reforming that system. And so that's what brings me here. And I'm happy to have him. Yes. <laughs> so now, now oh, you give me another one? Oh, oh you yeah. got another one, okay. I, I don't get too many <laughs> opportunities like this. <clears throat> now, you are one of the few black women to have argued a, court before, a trial before the Supreme Court and successfully win the case of Dwayne Buck. Can yes. you kind of explain and tell us how that came about? Sure, sure. So I spent 14 years at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. I ran the Criminal Justice Project, and then I became the litigation director. We did a breadth of work in that space. We represented children who were sentenced to life, uh, life in prison. We did police reform. We also did death penalty cases, and so my personal docket right, was the death penalty cases because that was my background and experience. Um, one day I got a phone call essentially saying, you know, would you be interested in joining uh, this particular case? And I said, okay, tell me about the case. And the case was, there's a gentleman on death row out of Texas, out of Houston, Texas. Um, it's not an innocence case. What happened was there's a shooting. He ultimately shoots and kills his girlfriend and another gentleman, um, and he's caught on the scene. Um, so it's not a whodunit from the beginning of the trial. The only question in this case was going to be whether or not this person was gonna be sentenced to death or not. So his trial counsel, preparing for you know trial, does the right thing. They hire an expert to help them. In Texas, the law is you can't be sentenced to death unless a jury says that the person on trial or the person who has you know, um, been convicted of murder is, is likely to commit criminal acts of violence in the future. It's called the future dangerousness finding. The jury has to say this person is likely to be a danger in the future 
in order to get a death sentence, prerequisite. So for our case, my case, counsel gets an expert to evaluate, is Mr. Buck gonna be dangerous in the future? That expert prepares a report. That report, unfortunately, says Dwayne Buck is more likely to commit criminal acts of violence in the future because he is black, period. Hmm. Now, all of you said, uh, um, and you should have, but counsel didn't, unfortunately, say, uh, there's something wrong with that. Instead of saying, that's not true, that's not constitutional, that can't go in front of the jury, Mr. Buck's own lawyers called this witness who then testified to the jury that he was, in fact, more likely to commit crimes in the future because he was black. That was very bad. It was doubly bad because there wasn't other evidence presented by the prosecution to meet that requirement. So essentially, defense counsel for Dwayne Edward Buck proves that he, is more, he should be sentenced to death based on his race. This case goes through rounds and rounds of appeals, and he loses. And so it is that he is sitting in the United States Supreme Court waiting to see if the court is going to take his case when I get this phone call. And so, of course, we say, yes, we're in. This is 2011. The Supreme Court does not take his case. And so now we're in trouble, right? We're now facing an execution in Texas. And you know Texas leads the country in execution, so we are in dire dire trouble. We spent the next seven years fighting the case um, in various courts. Um, we filed appeals in the trial court, in the, criminal, the Court of Criminal Appeals in Texas, in the Federal District Court, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, and we lost in every court we presented an appeal to, every single one. It wasn't until the case got to the United States Supreme Court, that's the only court actually in which we won. And I say that, I think it's important to say that because again, what I've told you, the record that I described to you, right, he should be executed based on his race is literally on the trial transcript. It didn't require, you know, guessing, it didn't require a hearing, it was literally just in the transcript of the trial, the penalty phase proceedings. And nonetheless, right, every single court other than the United States Supreme Court was prepared to see him go to his death um, on that record. So ultimately, we get to the United States Supreme Court with an enormous team, an enormous amount of effort and outreach. Um, you know, the court takes the case. Um, you know, this is, you know, I had the privilege and honor of arguing it before the court, but as any Supreme Court litiga litigator will tell you, right, it takes a village. And so there were a lot of people who poured into um, th that effort in that case. I argued um, in October of 2017 to an eight-person court. Justice Scalia had passed away, and Justice Gorsuch had not yet been confirmed. Um, but ultimately, we won the case. The Supreme Court struck down the death penalty in that case in a six to two vote with Justice John Roberts, the Chief Justice of the court, writing for the majority. So it was a um, overwhelming victory. Christina mentioned about appeals, how all of them being denied. I had appealed my case so many times that the last place I could appeal was the United States Supreme Court. And to my knowledge to this day, my case is still at the United States Supreme Court. So this, this is a lot of the problems that we're having is we have to go through so many channels just to get a person to acknowledge that there is something wrong about someone's case. So. Agreed. Agreed. And I was going to add to that. I mean, I think most, if I think most, if not most, but close to most of our cases are people who have already gone through all of their appeals, right? Mm -hmm. They've all been denied, the Innocence Project cases, right? Largely have had all of their appeals denied before, right, they get to us, and then we come in with the, you know, to, we're able to bring in DNA testing. Um, 
so you know, people often will say, you know, our cases are proof that the system worked, but um, anybody who has served, and how many years did you, you should tell them how many years you served? I spent 15 years incarcerated, four years on parole before I was given the pardon. And this is after I had made parole. I was denied parole eight times. Um, and the reason I was denied parole was because I would not admit to the crime that I was there for. There was no other reason they could deny me parole. While I was incarcerated, I became a certified welder. I became a certified mechanic, certified carpenter. And not only that, I worked in the medical department with nine women and only one correction officer in that space. But yet, I was there for two counts of rape, sodomy, robbery, and abduction. They denied me because I would not admit that I committed that crime. I even gone through taking sex offense programs that you have to take. And during those classes, the instructor kicked me out because I would not admit to committing the crime. But by state law, if you are incarcerated and have, you are a sex offender, you have to take these classes to be granted parole. I want to open the floor to questions, but before I do that, you guys can start lining up if you want to. I was going to say, I think this is really important, and there's so many aspects of your case that speak to the greater problem of wrongful conviction in this country and sort of the work that we do. So number one, right? Eyewitness misidentification is the leading cause of wrongful conviction um, among the DNA exonerations, right? Two-thirds of people who were exonerated by DNA evidence were misidentified. And again, right, this is this fundamental belief, like I believe it, right? I think if something happened to me, I would do all the things and I would absolutely remember, but right, I know in my rational mind that's not true because the research shows that it's not true. Um, the second issue I think that, that Marvin, you brought up um, is about this issue of acknowledging guilt, right? This is across the country, right? People who are innocent, right, and in prison, wrongfully convicted, are denied release because they will not acknowledge guilt in order to get parole. Parole asks and requires people to sort of, and it, in, in, I understand it, right, intellectually, right, to acknowledge that your mistakes, right, you wanna own and take responsibility for your mistakes. So for those who have actually committed a crime, that makes perfect sense. But it doesn't, there is no process, there's no space to allow for wrongful conviction in that process. So folks like Marvin have to make a choice, right? You either admit to something that you didn't do so you can get out of the nightmare that is prison, mm -hmm. right? Or you hold to your values and your truth and you stay in a maximum security penitentiary, right? These are absurd choices that people are being asked to make every single day in this country. And not just at the parole stage, right? Mm -hmm. Also, right at the pretrial stage. Mm -hmm. We know in this country, right, there's a process called um, the trial penalty. It's a, plea, it's, a, it's a plea bargain incentive process, right? There's so many cases in this country that are in criminal courts that the system has to incentivize encouraging people to plead guilty so that the courts aren't clogged up with trials. Um, and so the way that operates is that before a trial, the prosecutor will say, if you plead guilty, you can, for example, go home today if you're in, if you're in jail. But if you go to trial, right, you exercise your constitutional right to a trial by jury because you say you're innocent, then I am guaranteeing you 100 years in prison, right? Mm -hmm. You choose, right? What kind of choice is that, right? People who have families, jobs, homes, all of which are gonna be lost, Right? Even innocent people are going to make a rational, if coerced, decision to plead guilty, even if it's not true, and go home. And our cases also show, right, time and again, that innocent people are pleading guilty, right, and the DNA evidence is proving that. Um, so these issues come up over and over and over again in the wrongful conviction cases. And the beauty of using DNA to show wrongful conviction is that it really just cuts through the questions, right? Science has proven, right, these types of evidence and this kind of theories, right, innocent people don't plead guilty, 
eyewitnesses always get it right. It just cuts through all that and shows through science, right, that those things are not true. And it has required the system to reevaluate and to try to correct those kinds of, um, correct that, that kind of uh, conduct. So I do want to, again, invite questions, or we can keep going. I see a question. Hi, thank you for coming to talk to all of us. Um, I have a question related to like, where do you start and where do you end? So in a lot of these problems that are so sy systemic, um, you know, there was a place where you started and how did you choose that place? Maybe not you necessarily, but as the Innocence Project itself. Um, and then how do you know, I know it's grown in certain ways to not only talk about wrong, wrongful convictions and work on those, but also work on legislation and other components. Um, but there are so many other pieces to the system and prison uh, in and of itself that are also um, problematic in many ways. And so how did you know where to start and how do you know where to end? Well, that's a big question. So I'm going to answer for the Innocence Project, right? The Innocence Project started with, the, it was really, again, you, it's so hard for you to realize, right? It was a radical idea that there are innocent people in prison. So it starts with the call, the question, can we prove this hypothesis that there are actually innocent people in prison, right? Can we use science? Can we use DNA to prove the radical proposition that we are actually you know, convicting in a, totally innocent people, right? So that's the beginning. The beginning is, can we prove that? So yes, right, 278 and counting, we have proved that. But long before we get to 278, the Innocence Project recognizes it's really not enough to try to get people out on the backside. We actually have to stop people from coming in at the front end, right? You can't, it's, it would be insane to just stay, you know, trying to exonerate people if there just keeps coming, you know, coming into the system. And so then, you know, the organization dedicated itself through uh, the creation of a data policy, I mean, a data science and research department to identifying the trends in the cases, right? Tracking how many people have misidentification, how many people have false confessions, how many people have unreliable science, right? What are the issues that we are seeing across this body of cases? And then from that sort of, that, that learning, right, we launch a policy team that then goes out and says, hey, we need to correct the way people are, you know, the identification processes and procedures that people are using. Hey, we need to go out and, um, you know, think about the ways in which forensic science is admitted into criminal courts, right? We need to be doing all sorts of advocacy work to correct, right? So I always think it's like to shut the faucet off at the front end, you know, so we're no longer pouring out innocent people in the system. And not, and not only that, and I'm going to kick this to you, Marvin, we also have a social work department, which is incredibly important. Because again, Marvin did 15 years plus what, four on parole, right? That is deeply traumatic to the people. It's, listen, prison is an awful, god-awful place, right? It is a nightmare. Um, it's a nightmare for people who were guilty of the crimes, right, that they committed, right? It is an awful place, and we could talk about that, and I have feelings about it. It shouldn't be like that. But it is truly awful, right? If you haven't even been, you're not even guilty of the crime, right? The level of trauma that people endure, right, from being in prison and being innocent is extraordinary. And so we have a social work department that works closely with the folks that we represent who are coming home um, to start to deal with that trauma. And I would love for you to talk about, you know, what that was like to come home and When a person that has been falsely incarcerated for crimes that they did not commit, not only the system is sending that person to prison, but they're sending their families to prison. And when I say that, I may have been behind the fence suffering, but my family was suffering on the outside, trying to gather information evidence to prove my innocence, having the door shut in front of them as it was set in front of me. I was blessed to have a mother, father, siblings, 
grandparents that believed in me. My grandmother, <clears throat> she, she passed away four years ago at the age of 98. And I would go by her house every day, whether it was five minutes, 10 minutes, and just talk to her. You'd be surprised what the old people know, okay? And I would always ask her, you know, Mama, how you doing? She said, oh, I'm kicking. You're not kicking this high. I said, but you're kicking. You know, you're still kicking. I used to call her every day when I was incarcerated and just talk. And before she would get off the phone with me, she would say, just keep praying, baby. God have you there for a reason. Hmm. I couldn't figure out what that reason was. Now, I grew up in a family who my great-great-grandparents form at church. So I'm at church every Sunday. No my Bible, front to back, summertime. The whole time I was incarcerated, I read my Bible every day. And every time I get off the phone with her, she would say, just keep praying, baby. God have you there for a reason. I couldn't figure out what that reason was. Now, me and my God, we don't have some mean conversations. But the conversation that I was having with them wasn't the right conversation. I was always, why, why, why? You know I didn't do this. Why you had me here? When I got denied the last time for parole, that night when I went to my cell, I got on my hands and knees, and I just talked to him. You know, my, my prayer to him that night was, God, I don't know what is going on, why I'm here, why I can't be with my family. I said, but I have placed my trust in man. Look what it got me. I said, but you know I didn't do this. And I'm asking you to come into my heart and my mind and allow me to do your will. That was my prayer that night after being denied parole. You only allowed to go up for parole once a year. Two months later was when I received a letter saying that I was granted parole. And if that ain't God's work, who's it? Who's it? Now, I mentioned that, I, man, my Lord, we done had some discussions during my incarceration. But it made me realize, it also brought me back to what my grandmother had always said, me coming up in church, you know. God have you there for a reason. We may not know what the reason may be at the time we want to know. But when he's ready to present that reason, he will present it. For in my case, it made me understand him, his work. It made me turn to the Innocent Project. I didn't know them. They didn't know me. But it made me not only change the laws in my state in Virginia, because that's what it did. That's, that is what my case did. It changed laws in the state of Virginia. Not only changed law, but it made the governor at that time have every case that was done by the forensic at that time reopened. And out of that, there has been 17 other people who has been falsely accused, sent to prison, has been exonerated in the state of Virginia. You may not know what God's work has planned for you, but he has a reason for all of us. We just have to keep our faith and trust and allow him to do his work through you. Other, oh, we have another question. Please. Yeah, uh, thanks for sharing your stories. This is very powerful. And um, if I could follow up on what you just said, Marvin, too. How many other states uh, have followed up with more systematic reviews of kits and using evidence and then trying to identify who there may be you know, questions about uh, wrongful convictions on a broad scale to test all the kits and so forth. I thought I read about that at other places have started to do that. Is that true? I think that's a question for you. Yeah. 
Um, so you're talking about like a, an audit, right? So yeah. there are yeah. a variety of states that have done, or I shouldn't say states, jurisdictions. Usually that occurs in the wake of an exoneration or the wake of an identified sort of bad actor of some sort, right? There is a lab tech who has done something mm -hmm. wrong. Um, so yes, there are, I can't tell you the exact number, but certainly um, in instances where there is, you know, sort of clearly documented bad actors usually, right? Some jurisdictions, not as many as we would like, some jurisdictions will undertake sort of a systemic audit to make sure, you know, to, to identify the breadth of the problem. Mm -hmm. We often, often urge um, sort of those kind of audits, you know, in the wake of exonerations, and it really is, I, I, you know, I think it should happen far more often, um, given what we know about you know wrongful conviction and how it occurs, but it does happen. You know, I can't say it doesn't. It doesn't happen enough, is what I would say. But to, to ask some more on that, it also comes to the fact that a lot of the states, um, the prosecutors doesn't want to take on responsibility accountability. You know, that's, that's what it all, most of the states boils down to. No one wants to take the responsibility of a wrongful conviction. Um, a lot of the prosecutors has immunity. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one of the things that we, we've been trying and been fighting to have not only prosecutors, but judges as well be accountable for the actions they are taking in these courtrooms. Right. And, and that's one of the biggest fights that we actually face. Right. I mean, yeah, I, we're going to go back and forth, and we're going to get to your question. But right, I mean, I do want to say that out loud, which is to say that right in all of these cases where we have prosecutorial misconduct, we have defense, you know, totally ineffective defense counsel, we have police misconduct. Right, there is zero. Just so we're clear, there is zero accountability for these kinds of errors. Right, I am a defense lawyer of my whole life, as you know. Right, there is no nothing happens if you. Failed so, like in the Dwayne Buck case, my my case, right? This uh, United States Supreme Court declared that his trial lawyer was ineffective. Nothing, 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 nothing happens, right? Prosecutors, right, withholding it, you know evidence of innocence that send people to death row, that send people to prison for decades. It is discovered, it's you know disclosed. A person is exonerated. Nothing happens, mm -hmm. right? There, this is a systemic problem that until it is addressed, right, we're gonna keep having these kinds of misconduct and the kinds of, you know, behavior that contributes to wrongful convictions going on, right? That is a system, a systemic repair that just has to be addressed. Go ahead with your question. Uh, hi, thank you so much for coming in and talking to us today. So um, my question is, well, I have kind of two questions in one. So I guess first off, it's pretty obvious at this point, we live in like a very carceral society. I think the US has 4% of the world's population, but 25% of the prison population. Um, and I know there have been a lot of people like Brian Stevenson who have proposed um, almost alternative ideas for the criminal justice system. So I'm curious like, where your thoughts are with like what you envision for a more just um, criminal justice system, um, where the idea of forgiveness comes into play there, and how do you deal with like the emotional toll of working in a system that you know is unjust? So okay. I know that's a lot, but that's thank you. That's a lot you. of questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm gonna start with the last one. I'm gonna start with the last one. The emotional toll, don't sit down, because you're gonna make me remind, you can remind me of what the other questions were. So the emotional toll. So that is real, right? Um, I have a, a team of about 15, right, almost 20 lawyers, right, representing people who are behind prison walls and enduring all of the trauma um, that goes on behind prison walls, right, with them, um, right? As, as um, you know, Marvin will attest, right, it's the easiest phone call, the easiest phone call often you can make is to your lawyer, right? And so, we hear firsthand all the time, right, sort of all of the terrible things that are going on, and we, we build over the, right, these cases are being litigated for years, so you build really close relationships with the people that you represent. So it is deeply traumatic to be fighting for their freedom and experiencing secondarily what they are experiencing in prison, right, feeling responsible, right, as every lawyer that does this work does, feels is personally responsible 
right, for ensuring their freedom, even though, you know, I, you can say, right, that's not rational, but of course, right, it's my case, so it's ultimately my responsibility to ensure that I am able to deliver the freedom that you should have, right, and to the extent that you fail, it is an enormous weight. Um, so we are really intentional about recognizing, right, the vicarious trauma, the secondary stress and vicarious trauma that we all live with in doing this work. As an organization, we actually have a psychiatrist that is on retainer to the organization that works with us around those issues. It is available to every department, individual, right? My t each person who runs a team makes a decision about when, where, and how. My team, right, the executive department, uh, well, the senior leadership team meets with them quarterly, right? We just sit down and you know vomit out our feelings <laughs> for a while, right? We do therapy, right? We do, basically, we do group therapy. Right? But we are very intentional about making sure naming and owning and acknowledging and having processes for addressing um, that. The, sorry, then you asked. Oh, yeah, I also asked, sorry, it was like all over the place. Um, I also asked about, I guess, your vision then for a more like equitable form of the criminal justice system. Um, I know there's a lot of like wide-ranging responses um, ranging from like prison abolition to simple reform and just kind of what you see um, as maybe like an end goal and like the steps that you envision being taken in the process. I know it's a big question though. So I would say for, I'll give you the Innocence Project, I'll give you mine and I'll speak for the Innocence Project too. Um, you know, for the Innocence Project, right, what we want is a system that is that, that functions accurately, right? Or, you know, you're not gonna get perfection, right? We recognize, right, we can't ask for perfection. But we should be facile enough to be able to correct our own mistakes, right? And have the capacity to make changes when we know that things aren't working. Um, so, I mean, that's a, that, you know, that's super low hanging fruit, right? It should be, right? But we're not even there, right? We're not even at the ability to, um, to acknowledge error and correct for it, right? And so I think I'll say that for the institution. If you're asking me personally, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that um, I totally understand the value of the adversarial process, right, and the point of the adversarial process. And I think that there are lots of shortcomings that go with it, right, which is to say that, um, you know, I think, and this is not in the innocence, this is truly not in the innocence space, right? So speaking of, like, I've represented many people who, you know, committed terrible crimes. And the firewall between me, right, as defense counsel, and the people who um, suffered, right, who were victimized um, or, you know, or injured by my clients, I find unhelpful, right? Because you get locked in a side um, in a way that I think is um, artificial, right? When I think if you were actually, ta if we were talking about true justice, right? Like there would be some meeting of, of right, harm with accountability. And you can't do that with this, the very hard binary that we exist in. So in my, you know, my dream world, right? There would be far more um, of a bridge, right, where my clients would see, hear, you know, and be able to process, right, the trauma and the injury that were that was caused, right, in those cases. And again, this is me, non-innocence project cases, right, because I just think often victims aren't getting what they want, and you know, offenders aren't really, you know, understanding or don't have the capacity, you know, don't get the information to understand the depth of harm. So that's me personally. Thank you. Hi, um, thanks again to you both for coming to talk to us. My question is, um, I know you mentioned Brian Stevenson who founded the Equal Justice Initiative. My question is, have you ever like worked alongside them or been inspired by them or like connected with them in any way? Yes. <laughs> you wanna go first? Um, I met Brian several years ago and it was funny because Mr. Newfell I mean, he gets mad when I call him Mr. Newface. It's always Peter. Peter. <laughs> he was like, I want you to meet for him. And just listen to him and hear him out. And Brian walked up to me and I introduced myself. And he was like, I know you. You're Marvin Anderson. And he just started rumbling off about my whole entire case. And I'm like, whoa. 
how does he know my entire case? This man is so brilliant at knowing a case file, studying it from front to back. And the work that he does, oh my God. I was amazed that he is so in touch with not only just the justice system itself, but people. You know, just people. Um, and there have been several projects that he has worked on with the Innocent Project, yes. So he's an amazing guy. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I was gonna say same. I've known Brian for uh, as long as I've been, I've done so since I was, I don't know, 30 or so. He's about 10 years ahead of me um, in the practice. And so no, I've known Brian for years, right? He's an extraordinary mm -hmm. uh, litigator, an extraordinary visionary, an extraordinary storyteller for anyone that has sat in a room and listened to him speak. Um, you know, he's also, you know, very funny and down to earth and, um, you know, yeah, there's not, there, all the words, right? All the good words is what goes with Brian Stevenson. Yes, of course we partner, right, on cases, on issues, we overlap, right? Our, our, our work overlaps substantially. Um, so yes, we are, we are partners, peers, compadres mm -hmm. in the fight. Thank you for being here tonight. So my question is about the role of popular culture and media. So I don't know if either of you have seen the TV show Suits, but in season six, Meghan Markle's character takes on a case for the Innocence Project, and she gets the wrongful conviction of a man on death row overturned. So I was wondering what you think the role of popular culture and media plays in um, like promoting the Innocence Project and then even raising awareness about specific cases that you take on. Should I first? Go first. Go first. <laughs> I have a two-part answer. Let's just say this. <clears throat> and I would like for you all to really think about this. Today's society rather believe a lie than the truth. Okay? Now, <clears throat> when it comes to news media, they only go tell you what they want you to know. In a lot of people of color community, the news shows mostly of people being killed, robbed, or real bad things. That is constantly on the news. But when it comes to the Innocent Project or other organizations that help try to change our justice system, how often do you see it on the news? Now, we just had a brother of the Innocent Project who was exonerated not too long ago, and he was killed by a police officer. After, from coming, visiting his mother. One day on the news, that's it. So that's my feeling of their media. Um, it hurts me when I see that we still have people in our society that refuses to accept truth. Not only as a person, but even as science. A lot of people refuse to accept truth in science. So there are several things that the Innocent Project and other organizations such as I are, that are fighting a uphill battle with, but we are still pushing that battle. So. Yeah, I would say that there's no question, right, that I think that media influences public opinion about, you know, of how the criminal justice, the criminal legal system works, and everyone that tries a case will tell you about the law and order effect, right? Um, when picking a jury, right, you have to make, you want to make sure that people don't have unreasonable expectations of what the magic, right, that uh, a person, the, the police or the forensic people can produce, because, right, law and order, whatever's, well, we'll have you believe that, you know, it's literal magic that can happen. Um, and that's huge. That has had a huge impact. I would say, to your point, right, that 
the, there's a disproportionate representation of prosecutors in popular culture relative mm -hmm. to you know, the defense bar. Um, so you don't see quite the lionization of you know, criminal defense attorneys um, uh, re relative to um, prosecutors. And so I think that plays a role as well. I'm, I think more recently we've seen more of it come out mm -hmm. um, and that's better. Um, I will also say, however, that social media has played a very important role, right, in the cases that we work on because social media is like crowdsourcing, you know, it's a literal like crowdsourcing of public opinion, which is really important for our cases. So, for example, we had a year and a half ago, we, rep we still represent a woman named Melissa Lucio who was on, uh, who is on death row in Texas. She was under active... Um, she had a death warrant, right? She actually, we are, we know uh, that she um, has been convicted of a crime for which she is, we, we're confident that she is not guilty. Um, it's actually an accidental death of a child, um, not an intentional murder. Um, and, you know, but we were within days of her execution, but because of the pressure, honestly, leveraged by thousands and thousands of people across the world, just individuals, right? On Twitter, on TikTok, right? Phone calls, texts, you know, to the district attorney's office and to legislators in Texas made it clear, right, that the groundswell of public opinion on this case was so against an execution, right? And these are elected, right? Remember, like the people making these decisions are elected in most mm -hmm. jurisdictions, right? And so having this enormity of outcry from individuals just from across the world speaking up um, for her, you know, well, we got a stay of execution, right? So I think that that has been a remarkable um, change, right, in the way we, right, our, our stories are able to get out there. We are able to harness um, opinion um, to make really important, you know, decision makers have pause in a way that they otherwise wouldn't have, right? Because we're able to sort of, you know, you, we take the, right, it's no longer under cover of darkness that these things can happen, mm -hmm. right? We're able to push aside and show, you know, shine a real powerful spotlight on, on extraordinary injustice, and then they get to hear the response of the world when that happens. Hi, thank you for being here tonight. There's, I've heard a lot about this idea of progressive prosecution and like the idea that prosecution has a lot of power in terms of like charges and um, sentencing and so on. So I guess like having done the defense work you do, what are your thoughts on that? And is that something you've ever like considered or thought would be more helpful? Or if you just like really like think that defense is the better way to go? No, I don't think that. I think, I, so you know, the other, phenomenon that has occurred in my lifetime as a, you know, in the criminal legal system is the emergence, we talked about this a little bit over dinner, the emergence of uh, conviction integrity units, right? These are departments within a district attorney's office that is literally dedicated to identifying and correcting wrongful conviction. That phenomenon, which is literally of the last 10 years, in American history has never existed. This is like a brand spanking new response by you know law enforcement people who are tasked with prosecution of crime to take on right to recognize right and to commit themselves to correcting injustice that is like watershed change which is absolutely part of the product of right this phenomenon of this organization and others exposing wrongful conviction that's like classic progressive prosecutor um, example, right? To create fully staff, appropriately fund, and fully support, right? Mm -hmm. It's all your own office in, you know, the job of, you know, doing real justice, right? So absolutely, I think you need prosecutors, you know, in the, you know, in the country leaning in and thinking about, right, <coughs> how justice should be administered from both the prosecutor, you know, not just, the de it shouldn't just be the defense thinking that way, right? Prosecutors have enormous power. They can change, you know, the dynamics of the criminal legal system, you know, really in extraordinary ways. And that's just one example. Hello, um, my question is for you, Mr. Anderson. I was wondering if you have ever had contact with the victim of the case that you were accused for, and if so, how has that affected you and her, as far as you know? 
Uh, no. Um, <clears throat> when I went back to court for Lincoln's trial, and the only reason I had to appear at his trial was because I had to testify that I was found guilty in my trial and that I had been exonerated and all charges were dropped on me. Lincoln was found guilty and he was sentenced to two life sentences in 41 years, okay? What happened to that victim? It happened. Mm -hmm. It is real. She was not lying about what happened to her and she described what happened to her. However, she identified the wrong person. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people ask me, am I mad, upset with her? No, because it's real. I just wasn't the person. That is something that she has to work out with her God, her faith. Um, and yes, I, I still pray over her every night because it's a battle that any victim, not just her, but any victim of a serious crime such as that has to struggle with every day. Um, I'm also working with another organization that helps victims talk about what they've gone through. Uh, one of my best friends is Jennifer Thompson who accused a person of a sexual crime and yet came back and said she made a mistake. So what happens to these victims, these women and men, mm -hmm. don't think that a man can't get raped, he can, but what happened to them, it is a real crime. Hi, I wanted to say thank you guys for coming. This is a really great event. Um, I, my father has been incarcerated for my entire life and my case is similar to multitudes of children across the country. How can you assure like this flawed judicial system isn't ruining family structural integrity? And what, how do you, what do you say to the families trying to navigate life with an incarcerated family member? First of all, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate your vulnerability. So I'll give you the answer for what we do right now. You know, a big part of our social work team, again, like I talked, to, I talked about before, you know, we, we, they, we, they come into contact with our clients before they're exonerated, right, to prepare a path and the road forward. But part and parcel of what they're doing now is also working with the friends and the family and the support systems um, of the folks that are going to come home, right? Because we want to make sure that the pe the people who are going to receive our clients and you know support our clients when they come home understand, right, the trauma and all that they have endured and some of the and prepare them for some of the difficulties and things that they might not expect and they don't have any reason to know about, right? Because they haven't been part of uh, the penal system. And so we work really closely with family um, and friends of, of our clients. I mean, the heart of your question, though, is about over-incarceration, right? It's about, you know, whether and to what extent that we need to incarcerate people at the rates that we're doing it, at the lengths of times that we're doing it, um, and what you know, the society that we live in can do to support the families that are left behind. You know, that, I have to be honest, exceeds the four corners of, like, once again, the Innocence Project, but the reality that you know is that the statistics for children of incarcerated people are, you know, are not great, right? The odds they face are high, um, and, you know, I think especially, and not, not exclusively, but especially for people who are wrongfully conviction, convicted, right, there is, there is a debt owed to them as well, right, because of what's been taken. You know, we haven't talked a lot about sort of that debt which is owed, right, we can talk about that later, which is to say that there are still many jurisdictions that don't offer anything, right, to even the wrongfully convicted person, right? Many, most jurisdictions in the country provide some sort of compensation, but there are some that still provide zero. Right? So you're talking now like uh, 
like second, second generation, like second level compensation, um, when we haven't even achieved first level compensation yet, you know? Like we're still literally fighting to get Pennsylvania to acknowledge that they owe compensation to people that the state wrongfully convicted. Um, to get them to say, and, right, there's an entire network of people who are harmed, as Marvin said, right, they all did time, you know, with him, is like, we are not there yet. I could tell you in candor, we are not there yet. But I mean, it, it's 100% accurate. This is how hard it is. <clears throat> a person that has actually committed a crime, found guilty, goes to prison, does his time or her time, they have more rights, programs set up for them to return into their society than a person who was falsely accused, wrongfully convicted, sent to prison. There's not one program set up in any state that I know of where a person who was falsely or wrongfully convicted, granted, parole, or exonerated, whatever comes up, there's not a program to, that is set up to help them reestablish their life. But if it's a person who has done their time, they're able to get health care, government subsidized living, food stamps, or whatever you want to call it, all of that is set up for a person who actually done a crime before a person who has been exonerated for falsely accused of committing a crime. This is the society that we live in. And I'll just add to that, right? So folks like Marvin not only did all this time in prison, right? Think about what happens when there's no social security, right? So you're, you've not contributed into the system of social security because you've spent your, right, your meaningful working years in behind the prison walls. And so then let's just say, right, you get to retirement age, what are you gonna get? Nothing, right? The state makes a mistake, the state puts you in prison, the state is wrong, not only do you lose all that time, then there is no benefits available, there's no social, you know, social safety net available for you, you know, in your older years, even though you were literally denied the opportunity to contribute. I mean, there are so many structural problems with this system, it's, it's hard to even know where to begin. Um, thank you both for coming tonight. Um, I think that after hearing your amazing and equally horrifying stories, I guess the question that I'm left with is, what do we, or I, individually, what do I do as a person after hearing these things and reading about them and learning about them, what, what does one do, what do I do to help this situation aid the situation? So lots of different ways you can participate, right? So if you go onto the Innocence, my office, the Innocence Project website, there is, you can sign up, we will do text to action. So if there's something um, going on, a piece of legislation that we're supporting or a case that you, we need a, you know, awareness brought to, you know, subscribe, we will let you know and you can you know, be activated and join, right? Sort of the, the public voice of wrongful convictions, right? There's that. There is an Innocence Project here, multiple I think in Massachusetts, right? Become acquainted with them, right? Reach out to them, volunteer. You know, all of our organizations rely on volunteer help for a variety of reasons, often at the intake stage because we all get so many requests for assistance that we are struggling to keep up, keep our nose above the waterline, trying to process those requests for assistance. There are offices here that you know you should call and see where you can plug in and volunteer um, go to law school right mm -hmm. become a, an innocence project attorney right we are you know we are not we are not at capacity in this country in terms of people dedicating their time to representing people who have been wrongfully convicted right so there are lots and lots of ways that you could plug in you can volunteer social media right do the you know do the work and join us there's no shortage of opportunities Hi, um, thank you for coming and sharing um, your stories with us. Um, you talked a little bit about the sector of the Innocent Project that's working in the realm of not just isolating the cases of people who've been wrongfully convicted, but also trying to work on the front end. And my question is, what is the Innocent Project doing to address the issue that you mentioned of prosecutors and other entities making 
unlawful deals or withholding mm -hmm. um, critical information that would prove innocence of um, individuals. Yeah, we, we have a lot of various reforms that we're pushing on the front end or around uh, sort of law enforcement. So for example, we are urging um, transparency around police misconduct, right? We know, for example, from the Central Park Five and other cases, right, that um, in New York recently, we got a transparency statute that um, provides some information about police misconduct. And for example, in the Central Park Five case, the exonerated five, um, you know, I mean, like an extraordinary number of the people, the law enforcement officers that were involved in that arrest, right, had disciplinary histories, right? No surprise, right? This isn't rocket science. The people that are going to arrest and take a false confession from someone, right, are not going to be the finest um, law enforcement officers in the world, right? So that's one example of a reform, a law enforcement reform we, we are urging. Another example we talked about over dinner, right, we also know, right, that people confess to crimes they didn't commit. That, again, exemplified by the exonerated five, is a particular problem among kids because, of course, kids feel, right, the authority of police, right, you're going to kind of do what they tell you to do. Um, and so we recognize that in this country until about a year ago, in every state in the country, it was lawful for police to lie to kids to get them to confess to a crime. Right in the course of an interrogation, if I if Marvin is 15 and I am the cop, I can say, Marvin, uh, we found your DNA at the scene. Now this is a child. Now, right, and so I'm, I'm gonna. We found your DNA at the scene. I need you to confess, and then I'm gonna let you go home. Lies, lies, right? That is, those are both lies, right? But a kid is going to say, okay, right? You're scared. You're a kid, and so children are disproportionately represented among those who make false confessions. So that's another example of reforms that we push on the law enforcement front. Police should not be lying to children during the course of interrogation. That shouldn't even be hard, right? We urge uh, reforms around the issue of qualified immunity, right? We don't think that bad police officers, um, you know, that's, that jurisdictions should be, bad cops should have to pay, right? They, that jurisdictions that have bad cops engaging in conduct that causes wrongful conviction shouldn't be protected by the law, right? There should be compensation and there should be responsibility and liability, civil, um, for those actions. I, there's a long list of sort of law enforcement reforms that our policy team is advocating for that we think will make the process better. I mean, additionally, right, eyewitness identification reforms, there's just a, 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 a laundry list, really. But yeah, there's a lot of work being done around that. Hi, thanks for coming. Mr. Anderson, I was just curious about your experience in prison and how your relationships were with the other inmates. That's a good question. My first day arriving, I had two other inmates try to jump me. And another inmate who I did not know at that time saw what was going on and walked up behind me and asked them what they wanted to do. And from that time on, him and I became brothers throughout my entire incarceration. Not only that, um, we're still best friends even today. He has made parole. He was guilty of his crime that he was there for. Um, it's funny because when he found out that I had started a trucking company, when he made parole, he came home and he started his own trucking company. You know, so you meet people who has actually done that crime. They realize the mistake that he did at that time, and they want to be better when they come home. Mm -hmm. He's one of those guys. Um, Thomas Hainsworth, who through my case, helped get him exonerated. We were brothers. The entire time I was there, I never asked him what he was there for. He never asked me. These are some things that you just don't ask a person while you're incarcerated. Uh, I tell people a lot that you see things, you don't see things. You hear things, you don't hear things. That is the life that you have to live in there. That is the life. A lot of your TV, TV programs that you see, bad things happen in prison, is a lot worse than that. 
there were things that happened in prison when I was there that I still haven't told my mom about. Why? Because not only she's worrying about, am I okay there, it would have drove her crazy. Trying to fight to get me out knowing what I actually was going through while I was there. The friends in prison, one hand, that's what you can count them on, one hand. And that's how I live my life out here today. My true friends, I can still count on one hand. So first of all, thank you to those who stayed. The questions have been really great and I've been intrigued by those. And uh, thank you especially to both of you for your honesty and insight and knowledge of the system and uh, helping us to see that. So thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you.